Hello everyone, this is Professor Jeff Wilkerson with an introduction to exercise 23, finding the period of an eclipsing binary star system from the Astronomy Lab book, Astronomers as Observers and Experimenters, as published by Kendall Hunt. So in this exercise, really what we're doing is trying to find the period of an eclipsing binary star. Uh, this is actual data uh, from the research project that, that I do with students here at Luther College. And so this is, we have a, a lot of eclipses of this particular eclipsing binary star over the years. And this is a chance for you just to work with it a little bit, to say what can you squeeze out of this data set to try to understand something about that eclipsing system. There's a lot more you can do uh, with, with more data and with more time on task, but this is just an initial step to practice doing a little bit of analysis. And so let's think about eclipsing binary stars, first of all. If you're observing here, and you see two stars in orbit around their common center of mass here uh, that are orbiting this way. Uh, if they're right in the plane of the board as we've drawn like this, you will see one pass in front of the other from your point of view and it will block some of the light. When you see two stars, uh, more light. When you see one star, less light. And so if you make a light curve, which is what I would ask you to do here, a brightness versus time graph, a signal versus time graph, uh, it's gonna look like this. And I definitely encourage you to go back right now and look at exercise 18, uh, where we saw an eclipse in the pluto charon system and measured the diameters of those objects from just this, this exact same kind of thing going on with a binary Kuiper belt object, two objects in orbit around one another. And so now we're doing it with two stars. Uh, there are a lot of eclipsing binary stars on the sky. Uh, we see several of them in the field of view that we study. And one of the things that we want to, we want to think about a few things here. Uh, first of all, uh, you just got the data sets in the tables right here, and the data set you see is on July 4th, 2014, is in table 23.1, and in table 23.2, it's July 7th, uh, 2014, so you've got about three days separating those two eclipses, very close to, to exactly three days separating the two eclipses. So from that, we want to make this kind of curve. What you'll do when you make this kind of curve, what you'll see is that you don't get this nice flat bottom like this. And this shouldn't come as a surprise. So there are a few things we can think about. If you have two stars that are about the same size, if the two stars are exactly the same size, then as soon as you get into full eclipse, you've got to be coming right back out of eclipse. Okay, so you can't expect to see this kind of flat bottom unless one object is smaller than the other object. Uh, and so in a case where you have two stars uh, that are pretty close together like this, uh, that, that, are, that are, you know, that are pretty close together in size, it wouldn't be a surprise at all not to see this kind of flat bottom. The other thing is if it's a partial eclipse, if the, if the plane of orbit isn't exactly aligned, so you see a full eclipse like that, like if it's tilted up, then when it gets tilted up, you'll see one object just go past the other and just nip it and, and eat away a little bit of light. And that's what you've got going on in this system. Just a little tiny bit of the lights going away. So we've normalized the data out for you. We've actually averaged several images together uh, in order to make it a little bit cleaner for you to do these graphs. You can, as always, with the exercises in this uh, workbook, you can do these on a computer. You can do these on, on the paper that's provided in, in the back of the lab book. You can download graph paper. You can do uh, whatever you would like uh, in order to make these graphs. And so what we do here is we try to find the time of mid-eclipse. Our eclipses are going to look like this. That'll be a little bit noisy, and we want to find the time of mid-eclipse, and one of the great things that we can do is we can fit, so if you go back to exercise 18, uh, we call this time of first contact, this time of second contact, time of third contact, and time of fourth contact, where we saw an object uh, enter, that's first contact, and then we've got second contact, where it's completely across uh, it's either a full eclipse or blocking the maximum amount of light from the thing in the back. And then we've got time of third contact, which is right there. And then we've got time of fourth contact, uh, which is right there. And so we see that. In this case, where we've got an eclipse that looks something like this, I sometimes call that 2-3. Time of second and third. The second and third contacts have been collapsed together. We call that T1 and T4. And you can see where that happens, where you've got... Uh, first contact, then you've got maximum eclipse right there, T2, 3, and then you've got uh, T4 as the thing leaves uh, eclipse over here. Uh, so T, T1, let me draw that better for you. 
T1 looks like this, uh, T2, 3 looks like this, and T4 looks like that. And so that's what we have going on here. Uh, what, what you can do is try to figure the main, the main, one of the main goals here is to try to understand uh, what the possible period of this orbit is. And you'll find the period to be very short. What, what you saw there was, as I, as I showed you in those tables, there's only three days between these two eclipses that we've provided for you. And with these two eclipses, three days in between them, you know that the, 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 the time between two eclipses is, is at least three days. Uh, it's at least as short as three days, but you can imagine it being uh, significantly shorter than that, right? If it was one and a half days, you would see this. If it was 0.75 days, you would see this, and so on. And so you can imagine different values that you could see across there. Um, now, we would typically call, if we call this star A and this star B, you have star A passes in front of star B, then the next eclipse is going to be when star B passes in front of star A. That's half a period. And then star A has to get back around to pass in front of star B. That's the full period. So we would typically call the full period uh, not every eclipse. And, and sometimes when I work with the data, I think of odd number eclipses and even number eclipses. All the odd numbers are one star in front of another, eclipse one, eclipse two, eclipse three, eclipse four, eclipse five, as we move out through there. And all of the odd numbers uh, are one star passing in front of the other, and then the, the second star passing in front of the first star are going to be all the even number eclipses. So they move back and forth that way. So that's the thing we want to do, is we want to try to figure out what possible, thinking about the fact that when you see two eclipses, there must have been an integer number of eclipses that occurred between there. What are all the possible values of the time between those eclipses? And to say, well, we don't know if this was a, an even number eclipse or an odd number eclipse. We don't know if star A was in front of star B in both of these eclipses that you've got, or whether in one of these star B was in front of star A. So if that was the first eclipse later, and that was star B in front of star A, after the second time around, after star A was in front of star B the first time around, then the period would be six days. Right to say we're halfway through a period uh, when you when you measure this eclipse. So this is a good chance to work on this. Uh, good chance for you to practice fitting lines. You can do this with uh, by hand. You can do this with the computer, where you've got these what I call ingress, and you've got egress, and you want to average those out with a line. And when those two lines cross, that's going to be your time of t two three. And if you've got two times of t two three, you can probably measure those pretty precisely and get uh, the time between two eclipses like this and try to figure out what your periods must be looking at this thing. So this is this is what we're working on now. Uh, you can also get t one and t four, and that's going to give you the duration of the eclipse. Now these very short period eclipses, short period eclipse in binary systems, we would expect them to be circularized. We would expect them to have no eccentricity in their uh, orbits at all. But if they do have eccentricity in their orbits, then when one star passes in front of the other star, uh, you might see that. Suppose, it depends a little bit on what the orientation, depends a lot on what the orientation of that orbit is, but uh, there's a couple of different things, ways you could view this. You could see here, if you're observing up this direction and there's significant, uh, we're just going to lock in and act like one star's fixed at this point. If this star passes in front here and there's significant eccentricity, this star's going to be moving a lot more slowly here than it is here. In which case, it's going to be moving a lot more quickly here than it is here. A lot, very slow back here. So this eclipse is going to be very short compared to this eclipse. So there's value in trying to look at two eclipses and tell do they have the same duration or not. But also, if this is an odd number of eclipse, right? Eclipse one, that's eclipse two back there, the even numbers, then we come back around and have Eclipse 3, then we come back around and have Eclipse 4, then Eclipse 5, then Eclipse 6, then Eclipse 7, then Eclipse 8. Now you get to see what I was talking about with the even and odd numbers, right? And so now, you, there, it's also possible if the orientation were like this, then this would be odd to even, even to odd, let's say. and odd to even. So the time between two successive eclipses going from odd to even might be a different time duration than two successive eclipses going even to odd. So you have this possibility you could look for too. We don't have the data in this. You would need a, a longer series of these to be able to look for that. Uh, and we, we didn't want to inundate you with data. Uh, maybe in a future edition of the book we can do that. We can, we can really turn this into a project and see if you can uh, uh, start to do some of this to look for time differences going from here to here or here to here, to look for eccentricity in the orbit. Is there a chance this orbit is flattened? So we ask you to, 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 to look at that too, to, 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 at least for two successive orbits. We don't know the successive. Two orbits that we have plot, 
right there. They may both be odd. They may both be even. You, you don't know that from the work that you have, but you can at least test to see uh, T4 uh, minus T1. T4 minus T1 is going to give you the duration. I would fit the baseline. You could either average the baseline back here and see when this line crosses that baseline, or you could fit a line. You could fit line, 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 and, and see where all these lines cross to get your T1s, your T4s, and your T23s to understand the width, the duration of these eclipses, and the, the time of maximum eclipse right here, and then to check that again. Try to determine a period, and try to determine a... Um, you try to determine... A duration of these this, these eclipses and, and tell if they're are they consistent with one another what do you think about that uh, a little bit of uncertainty analysis would go a long way to tell me you're trying to understand whether you think they're consistent with one another or not now another thing that we'll look at right here is there's one of the discussion questions where we ask you to consider the fact that as these as these stars get further and further apart in their orbits so they get stretched out in their orbit right as they get stretched out in their orbit it doesn't take much tilt at all before you you don't see them eclipsing anymore if they're right on top of each other if they're touching each other uh you're going to see them eclipse almost no matter what the tilt of that orbit is uh relative to your line of sight if they're not exactly in this plane but if they get tipped up out of that plane just a little bit and they're very far apart you're going to see them go out of eclipse very quickly there they are in eclipse uh but as they get further and further apart you tilt it just a little bit and you don't see the eclipse see the eclipse don't see the eclipse Okay, and so uh, you can think about how the period is related uh, to the, the likelihood of seeing an eclipse, and that goes a long ways to telling you why it's much more common to see short period eclipsing binary stars than long period eclipsing binary stars, and why this example star that you're working with here from our data set has such a short period. And, and we have several other stars in our field of view, and they all have these very short periods, periods on the order of days or, or less, hours. And so that's what you're working with here and trying to figure out. I hope you enjoy this. This is a, you know, this is a foray into, into real data, sort of raw data, uh, that we took a couple of nights and, and plunked into there. And, and I hope it, you get a sense of some of, some of the, the excitement of being able to look at something. You know, this isn't a star. This isn't a canned star that there's a lot of papers published about that people know what the period is. So, for example, my research and I, students and I are, are working on this to try to figure out what is this period? Is this period changing with time? Is this period, uh, do we have any, uh, do we have any uh, evidence at all of eccentricity as we talked about right here from, from different durations of these eclipses? or different periods from odds to evens and evens to odds. And is there any evidence that that's changing with time? And so we're asking questions about what's going on with this very, very close system. These two stars are almost right on top of each other. And what can we learn about it? Does the eclipse depth change with time? That's the other thing you could measure, right? You can measure the depth from there to there. Uh, and to say, ah, are these two eclipses consistent with the same depth? If they're not the same depth and they're this close together, they're probably two different types of eclipses, odd or even, as we two different stars being eclipsed, uh, because it's unlikely, it's possible over long time that that thing is wobbling around, that plane of orbit is wobbling around, so you see the eclipse get deeper and shallower as it wobbles around. Uh, not necessarily likely, but possible that that's going on, and so we could look for that over a long time. But with two, two eclipses three days apart, you're probably not seeing evidence of that. And if you see different eclipse depths, you're probably seeing the, um, uh, the effect of two different stars uh, being eclipsed. Now, two stars right on top of each other like that, you might expect them to be the same temperature, and you might expect them uh, to not have different depths like that. And so this would be interesting stuff if we find that. So, so enjoy going to look for this sort of thing. Think about how you could turn this into a project. Imagine a research project where you've got hundreds of these eclipses stretching over decades. And you can turn this into a project where you could really start to study and understand something about these stars. And, and do we see these stars evolving? Do we see mass moving from one star to another star, which would change the orbital period? Do we see something else changing the orbital period? Do we see that orbital axis uh, uh, wobbling like we just talked about these sorts of things good luck with it everybody i hope you enjoy it i i, I enjoy working with this kind of data and, and it's a good little exercise to practice some some really important skills for the astronomer